Today we have my aunt and uncle, Phil and Kim Parker, and I have the privilege of talking to them because they are both professional music teachers. Phil, as a professor of music, what is the best advice you offer to students pursuing a career in music after college? Well, I'd say uh, certainly if you were wanting to uh, pursue music as a uh, profession, that uh, you have a passion for it and certainly a talent for it. The other uh, thing that I advise to nearly all of my students is to pursue a degree in music education because this allows you uh, to also have certification in teaching. Some people say, well, I'm really not interested in teaching, but I see students change their mind when they're a junior or a senior in college and they decide that they're, uh, uh, maybe they are interested in that and well now, now they've got to go pursue another year of school to make that up. So music education, uh, where I teach at Arkansas Tech University, we are prim primarily a music education department and um, if our students want a job we place 100% of them uh, just about every that's year they're, they're able to find uh, a, uh, a job and that's a pretty important thing. That's a wonderful ratio so, uh, too. <laughs> yeah, that's, those are my two, uh, the two things that I uh, usually make sure that a student uh, can answer those questions and, in that way. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite course to teach? Well, I teach uh, several academic courses. I have a music. I have two music theory uh, classes, a uh, an orchestration class, an ear training class. Uh, my instrument is percussion, so I have a not only percussion students but a percussion class and a percussion ensemble. And then I have a music history class that is uh, music from uh, late nineteenth uh, century through the present. That I say would say is my favorite class to teach because I, as, a, as a composer and just in general, I love uh, music of the 20, 20th and twenty first century. And uh, the students, other than you know, band music or maybe just popular music, uh, music of of the last century and this century, they're not all that knowledgeable about. Right. Uh, you know, if you mention. Uh, well, who's who's considered the foremost uh, classical composer of in America of the 20th century? And you know, most music majors, well, you know, they're kind of stumped. You know, well, I don't know. You so know? who would you say? And so, well, <laughs> I mean, the, the the conventional answer to that is Aaron Copeland. That's what I would have guessed. But uh, but as you know, in high school, they don't really have much connection with that no. uh, music unless they play in an orchestra. Uh, and when they get to college, um, they're beginning to get introduced to those, uh, to more classical music. But this particular course uh, focuses in more detail uh, on uh, music of the 20th century primarily. And um, they just find that they just love so many uh, things that they've listened to. I've got an extensive listening list. So right. Uh, they're able to, um, uh, you know, you're able to expose them to, to music that they really just haven't heard yes. before. Yes. And one of the, the things that seems, one of the styles that seems to be so uh, uh, popular is uh, minimalism. So okay. Steve Reich, Philip Glass, John Adams, and, and they're just like suddenly turned on to that, which was a kind of a, you know, 60s, 70s, right. 80s uh, era music and a style of music that you hear in commercials, in movies, in uh, okay. band music. I mean, the influence of that style, I, I think, also is why they're, they're kind of into that very beginning of, of some of the techniques that were used yes. in minimalism. And so they hear, I mean, that's familiar to them. And it's not the, uh, you know, the atonal music that we think of modern music, you know, right. bang on the drums and, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, blast on the trumpets and so forth with uh, 
without a key and that sort yes. of thing. Yes. So, you know, that, but they, they really enjoy. So it expos, exposing them to, to, you know, new types of music, new I music. think is, I enjoy that more than, than the other classes. And, but I enjoy teaching percussion. I, of course. I say, uh, maybe more than anything, but you said class, so I yes. <laughs> well, I was going to ask also, um, how what drew you to percussion in the first place? How did you choose that as your well? Instrument? You know, I mean, I remember beating on pots and pans, uh, lots of kids do that as a young child. But uh, when we moved to uh, we moved from a small town in Kansas to Kansas City in 1963, and in 1964, I would have been uh, 11, and a uh, seminal event happened in music, uh, popular music history in 1964. The Beatles oh, came yes. to America, and so uh, you know, kids my age were suddenly wanting to either play guitar or bass or drums. Or, right. I mean, you wanted to be Ringo or you wanted to be John or what. So you wanted to be Ringo. <laughs> and it was Ringo, you'd say, that's what I want to do. And, uh, of course, it was like playing in a rock band. You know? Right. And then you right. eventually find out, well, there's some steps to <laughs> learning uh, uh, to get to be able to play on a drum set. But right. that, that was the original motivation for that. And then I began taking lessons and took lessons uh, up until um, my freshman year of college. And it wasn't really until my senior year of high school that I decided, you know, I think maybe I want to do this for a career. But That's wonderful. Kim, what does a typical day look like for you as a school music educator? Okay, well, I am a halftime assistant band director. That's my title. Um, and so I do four hours a day on that, and then I teach my private students in between that. But as far as the public school part of it, um, I get up and I have a beginning flute class around 10.15. And so I go and do that, and I love it. I've get, gotten to do that the last two years. Um, and I've been teaching for 16, I think that's right. Oh, 16. Wow. Okay. But just now I'm getting to do that beginning flute class, so I do that. And then I... That's at the middle school, and then I run over to the high school, and I work and assist with the band class, which is um, sophomores through seniors, and we have about 270, something like that, oh, in wow. band. And so I do that, and then I um, actually teach a private lesson during lunch, okay. and then I, I have my prep time where I eat my lunch and prep for my music theory class. So I'm teaching the AP music theory um, class about seventh period. And I love doing that. And then I'm done as far as my school part because I'm just half time there. Right. Um, but I teach a lot of private students. So um, I have like 21 of those. And so I'm able, our school district is so good about allowing me to teach during school. So That's I can take wonderful. them out of band or like I said, I teach them during lunch time. And then I teach, you know, several after school. So my day is full, but it's only half time with the school as far as the school district. But then the rest then of that time is half for time the for private, my studio. private students. Well, and that's actually a nice, a nice split then, so you can kind of have the best of both worlds. It does, and then I'm lucky because I can, um, I since I don't really have too much, I do teach some of my private students at eight, right, before my other class. But on some days, I'm able to practice during that time because I'm half time. So it gives me a little bit of that leeway. That's helpful. Of it's having a little care. bit of that time that a lot of people that work full time and stuff like that don't have because I'm really big on still practicing. That's wonderful. <laughs> yes. Sometimes that's inspiring for the others of us music teachers because we get so wrapped up in teaching our own right. students, sometimes we lose the chance to, to practice ourselves. Tell, tell them what time you were practicing this oh, last I will. year. Okay, so this year, and I started practicing at 6.30 every morning. Oh, wow. So I would practice 6.30 to 7.30. So what did Phil think of this? Go, he slept through it. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I'm about seven. Really, really. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it really actually worked out really well, but it was the only time with that many students and with my school schedule that I could practice and do it well yes and I ended up loving it you enjoyed so, having that extra half hour to I, practice I really did now how many private students do you have right now 21 wow okay so right. you, you a have lot. a big studio and working at well, the schools well the, the thing is that since I started teaching the beginning flutes I had 
19 the first year and then I had 25 this last year. Um, with that first year when I had 19, well then some of those ended up being really, really good and I wanted to take them right. as private students. So I ended up with six of those, okay. which in the past, yeah, I wouldn't be teaching them quite that early. Right. Seventh grade. Normally I would start them with eighth grade. Okay. So that's, so I ended up having a lot more than normal. Yes, I was going to say, you have a very full schedule. Yes. Yes. What drew you to the flute? As your well, this instrument. is funny because um, as everybody in this household that I'm, you know, from the Shears start on violin. Yes, that's my instrument. Yes, <laughs> so I started on violin, and I guess I cried at my lessons. Oh, no. <laughs> and so my mom switched me over to flute, and the rest is history. I was going to say, it sounds like you enjoy it if you're yeah. still practicing when every I morning at 6.30. I went to Brevard Music Camp for two years in high school. That's what really made me decide, hey, I really want to do this. Because I had thought about being a veterinarian because I love animals, too. Oh, yeah. Um, but I really, Brevard Music Camp really is what steered me toward oh, music. That's wonderful. Phil, I've had the privilege of performing several of your compositions over the years. I remember when you wrote a song to accompany one of the poems I wrote when I was a kid. I also particularly loved playing your work, Mary Music, for my senior recital. Can you describe your creative process when you write, and what is your favorite composition? Well, oh, creative process, that's, that's a hard thing to answer because um, it's, sometimes it's different from piece to piece. That makes sense. Uh, people talk about how do you come up with ideas and things. And, right. Um, I guess there's a certain, you know, gift in it. That, oh, for sure. But, uh, um, but I, you know, it's definitely my view that any musician, you know, has the ability to, to create music. Um, I try to have uh, my students in theory, uh, in ear training even, I try to have them also um, do some composing and right. experience something in the creative part yeah. of the art. So I... For whatever reasons, about ninth grade, I we were I think we were playing a percussion ensemble in, in junior high school, and it was it had four or five people, drums and cymbals and stuff, and I kind of thought to myself, well, you know, I, I think I could write something yes. like this, you know. I, right. I was probably being a little more ambitious. Uh, <clears throat> my thinking at that point than I should have been, but so I I actually tried you know to write some percussion things for you know, maybe three four yeah. percussionists and and, um, and then as I just you know got more mature as a musician into high school I began to be interested then in band okay music right and so I would study. Uh, band scores during the lunch hour in high school instead of going to the cafeteria and, right. and uh, eating lunch. I'd stay in the band room and I'd just gather up usually scores that we were uh, of the music we were playing because I knew it and just try to figure out you know well, how do they have this orchestrated and you know how's the, the structured and right. so it was just kind of a score study that I just took upon myself um, just out of that interest, and I actually wrote a, a short piece for band when I was in high school. It wasn't very good, but none of our oh, first then, none of our first compositions or no, attempts at writing are very good. The funny thing, and, and I, we still have the manuscript from this, but I had the the uh, stems on the wrong oh, side the wrong of the note. Oh, you know. how funny! Yes, yes. Of course, nowadays you could just use music software. Right. What's your favorite music <laughs> software? <laughs> well, I use Sibelius, but okay. Finale Sibelius was the two. Okay two big ones. Right. Uh, at any rate, so <clears throat> as I got, you know, more mature uh, as a musician, particularly getting, getting into college, studying composition with Dr. Mays, Walter Mays at Wichita State, um, then you start learning, you know, a lot of the, the ins and outs of putting something together right. in music. So <clears throat> that creative process when you're not so uh, knowledgeable about the rudiments of music, you know, 
it's it's just you know you just try to do the best you can right but as you learn you know more of the elements of music and then have somebody to, to guide you then you start to have a lot more focus on you know the academic part of it right but where ideas come from and that you know it, it's hard to say you know you think about you might be inspired by some other piece of music that you, right. I mean, you don't want to copy it or something but you know it's thinking wow I really right. like what they're doing there or something in that piece of music and so you think you try to I mean all creative work in one way or another uh, is draws upon the past right? yes right uh, it's not you know uh, uh, all uh, composer great composers built on the composers of the past so yeah you listen to a lot of music and I think the more music you listen to uh, that the more that that just informs your own uh, knowledge a broader uh, perspective yes. on on uh, music music composition so that makes you I think also a better composer just by doing a lot of listening. A lot of listening. So yeah, you're inspired by things. And right. um, my poem when I was a little kid, the stream. <laughs> I remember the you stream. Kind of, that was you it. were inspired little by little uh, stream. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. You wrote this um, <laughs> piano piece. No, I think you wrote the. I wrote the words. You wrote, the, the, and you wrote, wrote, the, piano you wrote piece. the poem. Yeah, that's right. And I wrote the the music yes. to that. And then there was was there something else that you had. There may have been, or and may, I know I, I played Mary music. I think you wrote that well, for it, well, yeah, violin that was and a, piano. That was a, a, originally a violin and piano piece. Now yes. that actually I turned into a clarinet violin piano trio. Oh, really? And that just took off. There were oh, a lot okay. of people interested. So you in think of it more trio. as a trio, probably now? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it basically. I mean, I have it in. My catalog is right. also a violin, so but other than you and Valerie, I don't know think anybody else is. That's usually been performed. the trio. For I mean, there's okay. tons of violin literature. I mean, right. violinists mm -hmm. aren't really necessarily interested in a piece that's that's you know. Well, we enjoyed it. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was cute. That's nice but, to have it with the the clarinet because sometimes I haven't always found as many the, the, yeah, as compositions because that that's a very common trio clarinet, okay. violin, piano. Okay. A lot of good literature for that too, but um, they there've been a lot of of, of trios that have been interested. In, in yeah, that. that's wonderful. So anyway, to wrap up all that, it it um, it's sometimes hard to to say exactly uh, what inspires you. Uh, certainly other music and then sometimes it could be I have a piece uh, for uh, flute piccolo and percussion ensemble oh, nice. it's called when fireflies dance and it was sitting out on the deck and watching these lightning bugs right mm -hmm. right and I had a commission from uh, Penn State oh, to wonderful. write a piece for, right. for that combination and so I'm thinking well fireflies that be kind of a and so I came up with a little story, you know, and okay. so it's really kind of a program programmatic. Piece. I yeah, love right. programmatic music. So that's, As an know, author, that's another, myself, a musician. That's yeah. another thing, you know, you have that aspect of it, or of course you can have words, you, know, you set words to music. Right. right. So all of those have different kinds of inspiration yeah. to them. So. Fascinating. Phil, who is your favorite composer? Kind of one of your biggest inspirations. Uh, and this wasn't until I began studying composition formally. Uh, you know, in high school you have your favorite uh, composers that wrote some band piece that you were <laughs> playing, you know. Right. But when you uh, get uh, begin to get some education in music, then you're able to uh, uh, broaden your perspective a little more. And I've always, uh, and I think partly because my composition teacher was also uh, used this composer uh, as an example uh, in form and structure, was Bela Bartok, a Hungarian Oh, yes. Composer. I loved his Romanian so dances. He's, yes. And as a string player, I don't think there's any more sophisticated writer for strings uh, in the 20th century oh, than, nice. than Bartok. He, yes. He just... Yeah, he's in string quartets, and unbelievable. But, but he, uh, yeah, all of his work 
works are amazing on many different levels. And uh, and I have, you know, a, a pretty eclectic uh, collection of compositions. It could be something like merry music, very right. tonal and cutesy. And, yes. And then um, something that's, you know, pretty atonal for wind ensemble. Right. That's, you know, more... Uh, kind of up to date right okay. in that sense so uh but but you can hear sometimes certain little bartokian things okay in, in, in your in a your... few of the things that i've done um and but he's yeah and then my favorite piece of his would you know, probably have to be the concerto for orchestra so mm -hmm. my view is probably even more so than the rite of spring most profound piece of the really 20th century yeah I I think, I think there's uh, a number of people that feel that way. It's not, it's not uh, really a particularly radical statement. People think of the Rite of Spring as, you know, yes. of course it was written uh, much earlier uh, and certainly a landmark piece, but, um, but you know, for, for my taste, uh, it's the Bartok. So. Nice. Wonderful. All right, Kim and Phil, what is it like to be married to a fellow musician? Go ahead. All right, I'll go ahead. <laughs> well, there, it is wonderful. And, you know, we've been married now 45 years. Wow. And uh, so from day one, I, I knew I wanted to marry him from the very first really? date. He didn't yes. know that oh. <laughs> uh, quite as soon, but, but I did. And uh, I think the neatest thing about it is that we are so familiar with each other's lingo and our mm -hmm. the language of music yes um, he can understand how important it is for me to practice at 6 30 in the morning yes. or to keep going or just the first year that i taught ap music theory which was 16 years ago we spent every single night together him helping me he had been teaching theory at that point i don't know how many years right um but a lot and he was able to um help me know what to teach what not to teach if we if you teach this this will take care of all of these other type rules in music theory and I mean, we literally did that for the whole first year and so i was able to do that with him because i was married to yeah him. you had a wonderful and resource right so there sweet about it. in fact like, the next year i didn't really need as much and we missed it didn't we mm -hmm. yeah well i think it was leonard bernstein said that music's not a vocation it's a way of life Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I think you'll be able to, as a couple, share that way of life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Know, is, is, uh, exactly. Now, I, I, I know a, a couple that uh, I, you know, said something about, you know, I think it's nice when, when a, a couple shares the same profession. And they disagreed. They thought, uh, oh, you know, there's... I don't know what it was specifically, right. but they, they felt like... Probably depends uh, they, on the couple. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I guess maybe in that case that they were off doing their gigs and stuff and that maybe, you know, because they were uh, doing a lot of performing and apart from each other, right. you know, that they that they would uh, maybe think that that was keeping them from being together as much or something. Right. But we're both, we both mostly teach. Right, right. Um, I've, you know, played in uh, numerous orchestras and, and uh, Well, we both were able to play in the Fort Smith Symphony and together we for in that orchestra many years. For, uh, and that was fun. So, yeah, uh, yeah right. And uh, so, you know, we, we've always been together pretty yeah. much. That's not, so cool. Not much. Well, thank you guys so much for being willing to thank have an interview for, today. Yeah, yes, we're honored. Yes. Well, can you share with us where can we find you and all you do online? Uh, I have a very modest website that I've got a few uh, pieces, recordings of, of oh, pieces, wonderful. a couple of videos. We would love that. But a uh, bio and just, you know, some, some place for somebody to go. Yes. You know, if they want to want that information. Uh, and it's uh, Philip Parker. Uh, and it'd be one L in Philip. Philip okay. Parker Composer is all one word. 